Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you, Kinsman. And music services is always good. I love Sunday night. And I love Sunday night because you're here. We couldn't have this if you weren't here. And we're so thankful you come, and it means a lot to us to see you here on these Sunday evenings. As we spend these next, this next day giving more time to prayer than usual, uh, let me suggest several ways that you can pray. Uh, when you set aside time for prayer, and even a few minutes seems like a long time, I, I would suggest you might use your hymn book to pray. Uh, you, can, you can just look at the lyrics of a hymn, and it can prompt a lot of prayers as you just see it it's there. Think about what amazing grace can do to your heart if you spend 30 minutes with it, and think about every word. But especially, I recommend that you use the Word of God for prayer. There are many times in the epistles that Paul wrote that he breaks into prayer as he writes the people. And tonight as we come to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15 and following, we're in one of those times where Paul has been rehearsing the wonderful thing he always reminds people about when he begins a letter. He said, I want you to remember what Jesus Christ has done for you. Remember how you were selected by the Father. Remember how you were saved by the Son. Remember how you are sealed by the Spirit. You don't have to worry about whether God the Father loves you or not. He, he chose you. He does love you. You don't have to worry about whether your sins are forgiven or not. Jesus Christ paid for the forgiveness of your sins. You don't have to worry about keeping your salvation. You've been sealed by the, by the promise of God. And in verse 14 of chapter 1, the very last lines of where we left this Bible study off last Sunday evening, he said, who is a deposit, speaking of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And when Paul thinks about these people who have been selected by God, who have been saved by the Son, who have been sealed and guaranteed in their, in their salvation by the Spirit, he just breaks into prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you to the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints." As you spend time in these next few days, maybe you'd like to go over that paragraph in Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 15 to the end of the chapter, and just see all the wonderful things that are yours that God wants you to know and to have. He wants you to see that. He said, I want you to see it, and you can only see this with the eyes of your heart. You look there in, in verse, what is it, verse 17? Or verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, may be flooded with light so that you may have these things. And that's what we want to talk about tonight, seeing with the eyes of the heart. If you haven't learned to see with the eyes of your heart, you haven't learned to see well yet because there's so much there to see. When Hess did that wonderful children's story, and, and the kids were so delighted in thinking about that eagle that could see a fly on the back of the wall. I mean, I heard children talking about that for weeks. An eagle can see a fly on a wall that far away. I got to thinking about how God has made his creatures to see in so many unusual ways. There's the hawk, I read, that could see a, a rabbit. The hawk could be as high as the Empire State Building and can see a rabbit. On the, on the street below and know it was there. The honeybee has 1,500 facets in its eye. The honeybee can navigate by the sun because it has all these 1,500 things. And, and when the queen bee you know, passes out the fuel, there's only enough fuel for the bee to go get the nectar where he's going and come back so he can't be lost. He just can't get lost. And he navigates with those wonderful eyes that God has given him. Uh, the kingfisher, I saw some of these birds fishing. And then remember that this kingfisher, this bird who flies looking for fish, has great eyes to, to see above the water, to see the fish, and then he dives into the water to get the fish and has another set of eyes that he can see underwater. It, it is amazing. And I think one of the most interesting thing is that the hawk, who can be as high as the Empire State Building, looking down, can see a rabbit 
The rabbit has the kind of eyes that he can be looking down to the ground and see the hawk circling above him. It's interesting how God's creatures can see. Now, we talk about being able to see in many different ways. It's always been interesting to me to see someone get down at a piano and sit down there and say, let's, let's look at this and see what it sounds like. <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't sound quite right. That we're going to look at it and see what it sounds like. But well, we talk in that way. I grew up in a part of West Texas that was oil field and then moved in my early ministry in churches to West Texas farming communities where many people from Mexico used to come over on the Bracero program. And many of these were ambitious people and hardworking, fine citizen people. And they stayed and became citizens and became home and landowners. And many of our farmers in West Texas and members of our church were Mexican people that we call uh, Tex-Mex. And they spoke a language called Tex-Mex. It was a mixture. We all kind of spoke a Tex-Mex language, a mixture of Spanish and a mixture of English put together. And I remember there was one man who had a, a horse for sale and his neighbor came to this very honest man who was a, a neighbor of his, a, a fellow farm owner, and he said to this Mexican man who had the horse, I, I want to buy your horse. He said, well, I tell you, he don't look so good. And he said, well, he looks fine to me. He said, no, he don't look so good. And he said, well, I want to buy him. He looks fine to me. And so he bought the horse. A few days later, he brought him back somewhat dis disappointed and angry. He said, look, you sold me a blind horse. He said, I told you, he don't look so good. <laughs> well, what do you mean when you say see? No, we, we talk about physical vision when we see. We go to see the, the eye doctor, and he puts a chart on the wall, and, uh, and you, you say, he says, can you see that? And uh, some of us can, some of us can't. I have a friend who said, you take my glasses off, I won't even be able to see the wall. But the, but the fact is, he asks us if we see. That's physical vision. I heard a story uh, a few days ago I shared with men's Bible study. It doesn't really, I think calling it an Aggie joke is one of those unnecessary things to do, but they did. And it's about this man who went to see a doctor, and he was going to give him the eye test. He said, would you please put your right hand over your right eye? And he went like this. And he said, no, you, you don't get it. I mean, uh, would you put your left hand over your left eye? And he went like this. And the doctor said, well, I can't, I can't communicate with this guy. So he finally decided to get a paper sack. And he put the sack over the guy's head, and he took a knife, and he cut a little slit here, a little circle, and then a circle in the front of that eye. He's going to lift him up and say, you know, read the chart, just to keep the other guy covered. Well, when he lifted up the flap, there was a tear is streaming down this side of the guy's cheek. He lifted up the other flap, and he saw a tear streaming down the other cheek. And, and he said to him, did I cut you? Did I hurt you? He says, no, I was kind of hoping for horn rims. <laughs> Well, that's one way we can see, is we're seeing physical. And we don't always see the same way when we see physical. Your math teacher gets up, does a, does a question in algebra, and lets it all out, and, and lines it out, and makes the formula, and then he asks you, do you see it? And he's not speaking there about, do you see the numbers on the chalkboard? He's saying, do you understand the problem? Do you understand the solution? Do you see it? That's another way of seeing, a rational way of seeing that we talk about. And then some people have a, a historical way of seeing. I heard a man say, you know, every time we have a fuss, my wife gets historical. He said, don't you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. She remembers her first husband. <laughs> but we remember history. We see things by our own history. We understand and interpret things by what has happened to us. And we, we have this way, of, a historical way of seeing things. But the apostle said there's another way to see things and you need very much to see things this way or you'll never see the things of God at all. Plato and Aristotle in Paul's day had made popular a, a thing called inner vision. Pascal, who was the great French philosopher who was also a Christian, said the heart has reasons that reason can never understand. And that's another way of seeing. Seeing with the eyes of the heart. Seeing in a way that is an inner vision. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God with their hearts. They shall see him like that. Of course, there's the other kind of scripture, too, that says that the, their hearts became darkened and they were cast into outer darkness, as Paul talks about Romans 1 and the people who sinned against God and would not receive Christ as Lord and Savior. There is a, another way of seeing that's very important. It's seeing with the eyes of the heart. 
And it, the scripture here is saying that we can only do this, in verse 17, we can only have Christian knowledge when God is the source of our light. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Remember how God is called the God of light. Uh, light is the very symbol of God, that he is this brilliant light. He is, he is the essence of light. We, get, we are enlightened by the Lord God when we learn more and more of him. He's praying that we may have the enlightenment of God so that we may see with our hearts the thing God wants us to know. And then he describes what he means when he says to see with the eyes of the heart. Three things are involved in seeing with the heart. Three things that only God can give you. Three things that only God can do so that you may have the wisdom and the vision to see with the eyes of the heart. Those three things are wisdom and revelation and to know, to experientially know. He talks about wisdom. I pray that, that your eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He said, I want you to have the spirit of wisdom. The word in the biblical text is Sophia for wisdom. We get our word sophisticate from it. We've sure messed that one up, haven't we, in our English language. But, but this wisdom that comes from God is the, is the kind of wisdom that he's talking about here. It's a matter of, of the wisdom of being able to get to the heart of the matter. It's a being able to understand the way of God. It's being able to know how God thinks and what God's word is about a thing. It's, it's getting to the heart of the matter and understanding an understanding of what the will of God is and an ability and a desire to do that will. When you see with the eyes of your heart, you not only see what you need to know, but you do what you need to do. You not only understand the will and the way of God, but you do the will and the way of God. In James 1, 5, when the scripture says, I, if you lack wisdom, ask God. And he gives it to all people freely. But ask without doubting anything, trust him, and he will direct you and guide you. And Paul is praying for these Christians. He said, I, I've heard you've received Christ. I've heard how you, you were chosen by the Father. You were saved by the Son. You were sealed by the Spirit. And now I'm praying that you may have the, the eyes of your heart open so you may know what you have and know the joy that is there. And the first thing is the kind of wisdom that is able to get to the very heart of the matter, to understand the mind and the way and to do the way of God. And that's what he's praying for them. And he says, also, I pray for that you may have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. To have things revealed to you, revelation means to, uh, to see things that other people are not going to see. To be in touch with truths that other people are not going to understand. To see things that only God can reveal to you. That's why the book, the last book in your Bible is named The Revelation. As God just opened up the curtains and let John see what other people couldn't see and understand what they couldn't understand and know what they couldn't know and, and have described and to see before him the very wonderful things of God, the revelation of God. It's amazing how people can be so blind in their revelation of God, isn't it? Have you thought about what people worship? about what they, they really worship. Think about the days of Paul. As he looked around him, uh, and then just before his days, the, the strongest, most sophisticated people of the world were the Egyptians and the Greeks. Now the Egyptians, these are the people who gave us algebra. I'll never forgive them for that. They, they gave us algebra and geometry and mathematics and the alphabet, I mean, this all came out of Egypt. What a society that was. And you know what they worshiped? You know what God was to them? Bugs and bulls and snakes and fish and birds and dogs and cats. They, they had no revelation. They had no idea about God. They just had a lot of silly ideas, a lot of silly superstitions. They, they really had no idea. Somebody said if it, if it slimes in the mud, if it swims in the sea, if it, if it flies in the air, they worshipped it because they didn't have the revelation about God. They didn't know him. Think about the Greeks. My, what a sophisticated society was the Greeks. Uh, Aristotle, Plato, 
These were Greeks. Did, did you see in history what they worshipped? The Greeks really loved themselves, and they made sort of idols of themselves to worship, which is not far from what the rest of us do. But they made such ugly idols. Did you ever see the statue of Diana of the Ephesians? It ought to be X-rated. It, it's awful. It's, it's ugly. It's pitiful and grotesque kind of thing. And yet this is what they worshipped because they had no, no real concept of God. Sometimes if you want to do something interesting, ask someone you know who will answer honestly, what do you think about God, especially if that person is not a Christian. Sometimes they'll say, well, I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid if I come to God, he'll make me do stuff I don't want to do, go places I don't want to go, be someone I don't want to be. And God is so unlike that. They just haven't been revealed that God is the God who loves them. And what he wants for us is what we would want if we knew as much as he does because he's a loving and wonderful God. He said, I pray that with your eyes of your heart you will have a revelation, a revelation of what God is and what he wants to do with your life. And then look at the last part of that sentence in verse 18, or verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom. And that means that the spirit of God and your spirit work together to know this wisdom. As God reveals it to you, as you learn it from him, the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And, and the word really says here that you may keep on knowing him better and better and better. Now, one of the biggest indications that someone is not close to God is when they think they know all there is to know about God. That you may know him better and better and better. The real committed Christian never stops learning about God, never stops coming closer and closer to God. He comes to know him. And this word know does not mean just learning something. It means experiencing someone. It means up close, personal, intense, a loving relationship that I may know him. You know, the apostle prays that in many of these letters, oh, that I may know him and the joy of his resurrection. The goal of Paul's heart was to, to fully know the Lord Jesus Christ. One day he prayed that I may know as even I am known because God knows us. He knows us inside out. He knows our hearts. He knows our lives. The Bible says he reads our hearts, that the Holy Spirit interprets our hearts to the, to the Father in heaven. He knows us. He knows us so very well. And the Christian says, Lord, I want to know you like that. And so Paul is praying, I pray that you may know him better and better and better as you keep on knowing him. That's so very, very important. I used to be a fan of Mickey Mantles when I was a young man and Joe DiMaggio. And I knew, I knew everything I could know about Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio. Man, I, I knew their batting averages. I knew their contract disputes. I knew how much money they were making. I knew how many times they were at bat yesterday and how many hits they got, how many walks they had, uh, their fielding averages. I, I knew all about Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio because they were just some, they were my heroes when I was a child. But I didn't know them. I shook Mickey Mantle's hand once, and he was not impressed by me anyway. But I, I, didn't, I didn't know them. I never met Joe DiMaggio. I knew a lot about him. You know, sometimes I fear that so many Christians are like that. We know an awful lot about Jesus Christ, but we just don't know him. And you see how you get to know him is what we've recommended you do in these next few days, this next day. Take the time to talk to him. Take the time to pray Read more about him. Read all you can about him from this word. See how the apostle Paul prayed because the, the desire of his life was to know Jesus Christ. He was so infatuated with Jesus Christ, they called him a man in Christ. When James Stewart wrote a wonderful book about the apostle Paul, the title was A Man in Christ. As you may learn to know him, you learn to know a lot of wonderful things. And if we had time, and maybe next Sunday night we'll... We'll go into, or Sunday night sometime soon to come, we'll go into what it means to know him. It talks about power, the kind of power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It talks about knowing things that we would not know any other way. It talks about being in Christ and knowing him. But he said, that's what I pray for you, that you may know him 
Remember how the Bible says that when Jesus comes again, there will be a lot of people who said, Lord, we did so many great things in your name. Lord, we did this. Lord, we, it said we cast out demons. We did miracles. We did all kinds of things. Lord, we did a lot of things in your name. And, and the Lord is going to say, depart from me. Why? I never knew you. It's not knowing about Christ that this is about. It's knowing him. It's loving him. It's fellowshipping with him. It's spending time praying with him and talking with him and making sure that you don't do all the talking. You let this word talk to you and you let your own spirit talk to you as your spirit confers with the Holy Spirit. But take time to live a life of prayer, to get to know him and to know him well. There are different ways of seeing and knowing things. I, this, this service, which is broadcast on the Baptist Hour, is, is, uh, is recorded digitally. There's a special digital tape player now that records this. Just the old audio tape won't do anymore. And, the, and the, really the, the sounds that we're making here and, and, uh, and the beautiful music that they play on the program, the sounds are reduced to, to digitals. I mean, you can really see it. Somebody who knows how to read these things could actually get a print out of the sounds and read the sounds. You know, nowadays they can do light that way. They can actually measure light and they can do a printout where people can read light. But reading the sound of a beautiful hymn and hearing it sung are two different things, even though you can know them in both ways. Seeing some bars on a light bar on a, on a digital readout of the light is not like seeing the sun set over the Pacific Ocean. It's two different things. Hearing a lecture in physics about atomic power is not the same thing as seeing an atom explosion saying some things about Jesus Christ is not the same thing as accepting him as your Savior and your Lord and your very best friend and your constant companion and your one who loves you more than you'll ever be able to love yourself. And so Paul says to these brand new Christians, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, and I keep asking that the God of our Lord Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you that your word is like a a fathomless mind that the deeper we go, the richer the ore is and the more wonderful it is. Father, I pray you'll help us, especially in these next hours, to just learn to know you better. We pray for the eyes of our hearts to be opened. Lord, we pray for the wisdom to see things at their core, to see things like you see them. We pray for the revelation to see far past the boundaries of this world and know we're living for a much greater reason than just to shove through day by endless day, that we're headed toward joy and eternity and the beginning. Lord, I pray you'll help us to know you, to get to know you, love you, and honor you, and enjoy you better and better and better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing our hymn of invitation, and we want to invite you to do that thing that our Lord would have you do. If you want to profess your faith in Christ, we'd be so thrilled about that. Most everyone in this room has already done that, and we would be joyed at that. The Bible says the angels would be setting off a celebration if you were to profess your faith in Christ in heaven. We'll, you will enjoy that too here if you do it. Maybe there are people who would join our church. We would love to have you. We'd love to have you. We want you to know that. We want you to be a part of us. But whatever you would do that would honor God, let's do that now. While we stand and sing, you come and do God's will. Amen. 